Now, I will have to tell you all a couple of things. Number one, I did this talk to myself. A year ago, I knew that all the stuff coming down, you're going to hear tomorrow morning all about MIPS and MACRA and meaningless use, excuse me, meaningful use and things like that. The thing is, um, I suggested that they, uh, we look into uh, trying to find ways to help us to meet up so that we can reach those uh, criteria. You're all going to have to start looking at not only, they're going to start talking about cost-effective medicine, and one of the nice things is there's a bit of a guide to help us toward that. First off, here's my incomplete relevant disclosures. It doesn't have really anything relevant to today's talk, though, except I will mention one of the drugs. Um, Choosing Wisely was a program put up by the ABIM about four years ago. And what they did was they went to a number of the specialty organizations and said, give us five ideas that will help to cut down on wasteful spending. Doing, looking at tests and things like that, trying to do what's test, what lab, what x-ray, how often to do them and everything else. And what they asked for was evidence-based recommendations. And so these are things that both the patient and the provider should question whether they really need. Um, the biggest things is they wanted them to have, number one, support by evidence. Number two, they wouldn't duplicate other tests. Number three, free from harm, because they don't want to hurt the patient. And last but not least, they want to try and choose things that are really, truly necessary for the care of the patient. And so I, being a rheumatologist, suggested that maybe we ought to do this. And I said, let's put together a talk on adult and pediatric rheumatology. And they said, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't you do it? And that was not a fun because it's very hard to talk about these 10 items and try and make a very cohesive talk. So it will be jumping around a lot of different subjects. But hopefully, by the end of today, you'll have some ideas of some different things to do. Here are the ACR adult rheumatology recommendations. Number one, don't test ANA subserologies without a positive ANA. Number two, don't test for Lyme disease without an ex you know, some specific reason. Number three, don't do MRIs on peripheral joints. Number four, don't prescribe biologics for RA before you've tried some of the non-biologic ones that are a lot cheaper. And last but not least, you know, what is an SMA meeting without talking about DEXs and osteoporosis at least once? And this one was don't talk and routinely repeat DEXA scans more than every two years. These are the five for the kids. And again, the ANA shows up. Don't order autoantibody panels unless you've got a positive ANA. Lyme disease also shows up. Um, don't do surveillance x-rays on JIA patients. Don't perform methotrexate toxicity studies more than every 12 weeks. And last but not least, don't repeat the ANA if it's positive in a child with JAIA. Let's go on to the, let's talk about three of them which are doing dealing with the anti-nuclear antibody. Basically, it's the idea that if you have a positive ANA, you should have a positive ANA before you do labs. And also, if a patient with JIA has positive ANA, it doesn't need to be repeated. This is, first of all, the big reason somebody's going to order an ANA. Obviously, this patient comes in, you see this facial rash, it spares the nasolabial, whoop, pardon me, um, spares the nasolabial folds, it's an African-American patient, therefore you think, obviously, lupus. And the test you're going to order to help with the diagnosis is the anti-nuclear antibody. I'm going to give this for some of the older uh, physicians, being one of the old fogies now in the room, too. This is a test that, we, that was the predecessor to the ANA. Before the ANA, we had a test called an LE cell prep. And this is what it looked like. What we would do is we would lyse some cells. We would then put the patient's serum in there and then let it sit. And then what would happen is the patient's serum would coat the um, nucleus of a cell and the polymorphic nuclear cells would eat it up. This was the original way that we would help to diagnose lupus was by an LE cell prep. Once we got the ANAs, then we really, that went to the wayside. That is about as useful nowadays as a slide rule, so don't bother doing it. But I thought for historical purposes, some of you young folk may want to enjoy that. This is what an immunofluorescent anti-nuclear antibody looks like. When you get your ANA, it talks about patterns. These are the four major patterns. You have the homogeneous, you have the um, nuclear here, you have the rim pattern, and then these here are the um, uh, anti um, centromere antibodies. But you can see that each one of these is a little bit different, 
And back then, historically, it was important because we used the different patterns before we were able to do the subtypes. That's how we started to look at which disease was more likely to be going on. In terms of immunofluorescent assay, 95% of people with lupus are going to have a positive ANA. It is also positive, however, in a number of other diseases, and so it is not specific for ANA. I know that a lot of patients are told when they have an ANA, oh, that's your lupus test. It's important to realize that diseases like mixed connective tissue disease or overlap syndrome it's seen in, drug-induced lupus, scleroderma, Sjogren's, polymyositis, there's a whole host of other diseases that can have a positive ANA. Now, these are some of the specific autoantibodies we have. We have the double-stranded DNA. We have the single-strand DNA. This is one I've never used. It's probably not that much useful. The anti-Smith, which is a small protein complex. There's ribonuclear protein, which, um, and then you have SSA and SSB. The old names were Rho and La. These were named for patients. Now we go with SSA and SSB. Um, in terms of specificity for the disease, double-stranded DNA is seen pretty much only in lupus patients. Histone antibodies is much more for drug-induced lupus. Anti-Smith is one that's seen in about one-third of patients with lupus. It's one that helps us if, because it points toward patients who are more likely to have lung and kidney problems. Double-stranded DNA also re goes along with the renal disease. RNP is seen in a small percentage of lupus. SSA and SSB are also seen there. The SSA is important because in the 5% of people that are ANA negative, that have lu truly have lupus, they're going to be invariably positive for the SSA. So that's, and also it's very strongly positive, uh, likely in patients with cutaneous lupus. All right, this is how an immunofluorescent ANA is done. You take the patient's serum you put in it that has the antibodies in it. You have a cell. You put it on there, and then a fluorescent labeled um, immunoglobulin is added. That's how it shows up. Now, there is another way that's being done, and a lot of you probably in your hospital have noticed that there's another test that's being done, and they use the term multi-light, and it's done by a company, by Athena. They have a machine. This is what they do. They load antigen here. They add the serum antibody, and then they look for the, and this is an ELISA test, and they look under here and see how positive or negative. The problem is with this test is the antinuclear antibody. You all know how many different types of antinuclear antibodies have been identified now? About 150. This ELISA test will pick up eight to 10 different antinuclear antibodies. And so the problem is when we talk about how do you, diff, you know, which one is the better one, basically we know that you can pick up 150 here. The false, there is a lot of false positives in, in patients with lupus, I mean with the ANA. Believe it or not, 10% of the adult population with an ANA of 1 to 40, it's a false positive. We see them all the time, patients referred with a positive ANA of 1 to 40. The most common cause of a positive, weak positive ANA is two words, getting older. We'll see them in much older, in older populations, it becomes more likely. Now the ELISA test, the problem with it is there's a lot of false positives. I have seen a patient that literally will start off with a positive test that can, you know, where they're cut off with 300 over 600. Four weeks later when they came to see me, we ordered it. I thought I was getting the IFA. We actually got the repeat one. This time it was 310. The third time when we finally got it right, they ran it just for fun and it was negative. So there's a lot of variability with the ELISA test. Not only do you see a lot of false positives, but you see a lot of false negatives. As much as one-third of patients with real live lupus may have a negative ANA by ELISA. The problem with this is that you know, a lot of labs, they'll do this screen test, and they'll only do the um, autoantibodies if it's positive, which means the patients that would be needing the test, unfortunately, may not show up. And so I don't think this is a test that if you ask rheumatologists, it's not one most of us like. The thing is, um, and going on, we'll get to that in a second, the ANA in pediatrics patients, it is associated not only with lupus, but it also identifies patients with GI, who have JIA at a higher risk of uh, inflammatory disease. We're going to talk about JIA in just a minute. Um, basically, if you're wanting to really get the best data for your buck when you're doing an ANA, the American College of Rheumatology position statement from last year is that the, they, we support using immunofluorescent assay using the HEP2 substrate. That way you will get your best results. It'll be a consistent, you know, much more consistent. 
and it's one that you know, we, can, we know what we're dealing with. Going on, let's talk about JIA. JIA is a juvenile inflammatory arthritis. You notice that we're not calling it JRA. And that is because there's a realization that juvenile inflammatory arthritis is not just a kid's version of rheumatoid arthritis. Generally, the people who have it, the onset is usually at 16 or less. You have symptoms of joint problems for at least six weeks. At least one or more joints have inflammation in the joint. And you've also excluded other rheumatologic disorders. Now, when we break it down, there are three major classes. There is the posse articular for a few joints, polyarticular, and then there's a systemic form of fever. That's the one known as Stills disease. Um, the most common one by far is the posse articular. About half, almost half of all patients with JIA are going to have the posse articular. It involves four or fewer joints. Usually doesn't hit the hip. That's sort of an interesting thing. Then we start looking at other diseases. Um, we look for these, their patients are generally negative for rheumatoid factor, but a percentage of them, especially young females, will have a positive ANA. And this is where the ANA is extremely important in a JIA patient because if a child has a positive ANA, they are at a significant increased risk of developing anterior, a very symptomatic anterior uveitis. And so we will see patients come in with this kind of eye problem and they've got a couple of joints hurting and unfortunately, that's not something we can um, undo. The basic thing is if I have a patient come in, has two or three joints, young lady, I do an ANA and it's positive, they're going to get eye exams every three months for the next five to ten years because that's how serious this can be because it can lead to blindness. Um, let me move on. Let's see. There it is. Now, here's an x-ray of a patient in posse articular JIA. And the reason I put this in here is that there are times when we will do joint exams or x-rays. And you can see here, this is a joint that has been damaged by it. What happens, and this is why we want to treat posse articular JIA pretty aggressively, is that this can cause early closure of the um, growth plate. And if that happens, you get a leg length discrepancy. And this is one of the, th you know, this is where we may do x-rays to see what kind of involvement. And you can see here that the growth plate here is much more closed compared to it over here, and that's going to cause problems later on to the child. In terms of treatments for posse articular JIA, uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the first level. We use anti-inflammatory doses. In terms of naproxen, it's 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day in a divided dose. Um, you have to, you know, you have to give it at least two months to see how it's going to do. We will do glucocorticoid injections if it's only one or two joints. Getting a seven-year-old to lie there and do a glucocorticoid injection is not a fun experience, and I've had to do that, unfortunately. If we see the problems uh, continuing, then we do look at medicines. The first one we do use is methotrexate. The nice thing about methotrexate uh, is that while it comes in an injectable form, you can actually squirt that into orange juice, and so it's a lot easier than making a kid take a pill. Um, finally, we are using biologic medications. There are several that are FDA approved for, uh, for juvenile arthritis, and these are people who have failed the methotrexate and the NSAIDs. Right now, uh, TNFs are FDA approved, abatacept, and tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 medicine. Polyarticular JIA, this is multiple joints. They are less likely to have problems with the eyes. I still do the JIA, the uh, ANA, because I want to make sure that it's not a, a juvenile lupus patient. And so anyway, again, we start off with NSAIDs, move on to methotrexate pretty quickly, and then even on to the biologics. And I, there is one, of rituximab, which is not FDA approved, but in people who are rheumatoid factor positive, they may be just young onset uh, adult RA. And so that's when we may consider. And finally, Stills disease, we will do this with NSAIDs, but I can guarantee you it's not going to happen. So we end up pretty quickly going on to uh, methotrexate and then on to biologics. One family of medicines that is FDA approved now is the interleukin-1 agents, and that's canakimumab and anakinra. Uh, the canakimumab, the advantage to it is it's every three months. Anakinra is once every day, and so it's hard to get the little kids to take it. Um, going on, monitoring of treatment. This is where we get to the next one. And again, with methotrexates, we, prior to onset of medicines, we do a CBC and we'll do chemistry tests. And then we'll do it monthly at first, 
and then we'll move on to getting it stable every three months. We don't need to be subjecting a child to blood test every four to six weeks. Uh, it just gets very hard. And some of these kids become used to being a pin cushion, but it's a lot nicer if we can get away with not doing that. With the biologic medicines, whenever we start them, first thing we're always going to do is test for tuberculosis and hepatitis screening. Hepatitis is not very likely in this population, but if they were a juvenile and received met, you know, um, blood products, sometimes they actually can get it. And then we do testing about every three months. Um, juvenile, you know, as I said, one of the uh, official things is that we don't do a lot of x-rays on children. Um, we do one at times to see if there's damage and destruction, if there's early growth plate, because that may require surgical intervention. But the one problem is we don't want to try and do it because of re you know, the repeated exposure. MRIs can actually pick up if there's active inflammation in the joint, but the cost of them and also trying to get a five-year-old to lie still in a tube for 45 minutes is not the easiest thing to do. One that we're going to talk about in a few minutes that's really becoming a lot more popular in the rheumatology circles is musculoskeletal ultrasound. And this is one that we can do. We can do it less expensive. It's a lot much less expensive than MRI. It tells us a lot more information. And so this is an area where you might want to, you know, if you have a good um, radiology department with someone with expertise in musculoskeletal ultrasound, this might be a way to go. So basically, when it comes to kids, the, you know, based on the pediatric recommendations, number one, we don't do joint radio, you know, do, do them to, to monitor JIA activity. Number two, we basically don't perform methotrexate toxicity until it's that. And finally, if they have a positive ANA, there's no need to repeat it. Serial ANA titers are without any value. Now, let's switch to another one. You notice that one topic was on both of them, and um, the adult and pediatric areas, it says don't test for Lyme disease as a cause of musculoskeletal symptoms without exposure history and appropriate examination findings. I think this is a nice time, this is actually sort of nice because I can give a quick you know, review of what the heck Lyme disease is. First of all, we know that there are about 30,000 cases a year. This has been over, over the last, um, you know, since 1995, and there's been a bit of an increase, and it may be that this increase is because of better surveillance, better identification of cases. And so, but once we've gotten to where we can identify, you can see it stays right at about, about 25 to 30,000 cases a year. In terms of um, time of the year, it is important to realize this is not a disease that is an all-year finding. This is important because when you're trying to decide could this be Lyme disease, look at the time of year uh, that is coming on. By far the most common months for cases coming on is June and July. They're next to none in January, next to none in December. This is the distribution of the Lyme disease cases within 2012. And one of the things you'll notice is most of the cases are way up here in the Northeast, maybe getting a lot of Maryland, around the Washington, D.C. area. There's an area here. And then you have a lot in Wisconsin and Minnesota. One thing that's nice is if you look down where we are, you know, where the southern people are mostly, there are very, very few cases that are occurring. And that's some good news. It's important to recognize common things occur commonly. If I'm practicing in uh, Long Island, New York, and somebody comes in, I may be more likely to see it than if I'm in Augusta, Georgia. This is the, a picture of the ticks. Most of you have never seen what the deer tick. We all know that it's a deer tick and everything else. Up on the top row here, this is the black-legged deer tick, Ixodes scapularis. This is the one that transmits Lyme disease. In fact, the one that is the uh, big transmitter is this little fella here, the, limp, the nymph. And what you will notice compared to the dime is look how darn small it is. These compared to that are Lone Star Tick and Dog Tick. This is the tick you find on your dog. And, so, and what you will notice is that's a dog tick, that's a nymph. The dog tick is a whole heck of a lot bigger. And so that should be a real tip off whether you really have truly the Lyme disease is when they say, I've got a tick on me, is it the big one or is it, you know, is it that? This is the classic erythema migrans lesion. You can see the bullseye lesion and what you'll notice that little spot there, that's the bug. It is tiny. It is about the size, the body is about the size of the ball in your ballpoint pen. 
And so that's an important thing to realize. Um, now, there are several stages to Lyme disease. The first stage is early, and that's when the patients have that single lesion, and that's when they have the, you know, a, or that after, the single lesion is actually seen right at the infection site. The early one, you may have several lesions. You have regional adenopathy, flu-like symptom. You may see Bell's palsy. You may see some carditis and conjunctivitis problems. Stage two is the early disseminated, and that's when you start to see the multiple lesions. You start to see diffuse erythema, migratory arthralgias, or arthritis. And then you start to see the Bell's palsy and the meningoencephalitis. Late stages, that's when we start to see the big problems like chronic encephalitis. You'll see uh, oligoarthritis, and you can see sensory motor neuropathies. Now, this is a patient with early disseminated disease. Why do I say that? Because here you can see the nice bullseye lesion there. You see another lesion there. You see another one there. You see another one there. This is, when, this is very diagnostic. If you see a patient with the lesions and they're growing and the area is becoming clear, that's the erythema migrans, and this is what is going to be seen in 90-plus percent of the patients with Lyme disease. Um, in terms of joint involvement, everyone knows somebody coming in with joint problems, and in the early stages, all they may have is an early arthralgia, just a little bit of achiness here and there. In the disseminated, we start to see bursitis, tendonitis, muscle pain, and so forth, maybe some brief arthritis attacks. The arthritis with Lyme disease causes like a large joint, like a knee or an elbow, you get an intense, large effusion in them. And that's the big tip off for it. So a little joint pain is not enough. They usually have a pretty good sized effusion in the joint. Later on, we'll see the chronic oligoarthritis. We'll see arthritis attacks. We'll see uh, enthesopathy because that's where the uh, tendon inserts and some subluxation and periostitis. Now, in terms of treating Lyme disease, here are some important points. If you have a patient who comes in and they were out and they feel dressed a deer and they were out there overnight for the weekend and you've got that, lead, you know, then so they saw the tick. Prophylaxis is doxycycline, 120 to 200 milligrams for 20 days. There have been some papers that have looked at whether you can give a single dose. The data does not support that at this time. 21 days is the way to go for prophylaxis. In early Lyme disease, your choices are the doxycycline for four to six weeks, cefuroxime, or amoxicillin. You also can go with azithromycin for at least 21 days. And, if you see, and so if you see a patient which comes in with the, the multiple lesions, I'd treat it. In terms of late, early disseminated disease, um, we don't need to be necessarily using IV antibiotics. If they come in with a little facial nerve palsy, believe it or not, the most, most of them do quite well just with doxycycline for 21 days. When they have pretty significant neurologic disease, then we're talking about the IV antibiotics, ceftriaxone or cefotaxime. And again, it's 20, 10 to 28 days. I'd probably go for four weeks on any of this. With the late disease, you need to, believe it or not, with it's just the arthritis, believe it or not, oral medicines is enough, but in the late neurologic problems, then ceftriaxone is also indicated. This is an important thing, post-Lyme syndrome. Despite this, this you know, these feeling of whether there is a true post-Lyme syndrome, prolonged antibiotics have never been shown to have any benefit whatsoever. And so this, again, has to do with wasting your time and your money. Now, I would not put on six months of antibiotics. It's just not going to help. Now, serologic testing for Lyme disease. When, you know, let's talk about what they are. First one, it's important to realize it's a two-tier testing strategy. The first thing they do is the ELISA. And this is a very, very highly sensitive test. Should be done first. And if it is, because if it is negative, you don't need to do another thing. Now, the Western blot test is done only if the ELISA test is positive or equivocal, and you really want to use the same serum sample because you're trying to make sure it's the, same, the right patient. They'll do IgG and IgM for early disseminated, and you want to do IgG is all that's needed later on. Now, when do you do it? Uh, indications. Number one, recent history of being in, pardon my typographical error, Recent history of being in an area that's endemic for Lyme disease and a risk of exposure to ticks. These are times when you might do it. If they've been out there, they've seen a dog tick, they've, or a horse, or the deer tick, they've been out hunting, things like that, that's a good possibility. 
symptoms consistent with early you know, disseminated disease, such as the um, meningitis, the arthritis, the carditis. One thing you'll notice it's not there is that rash. The thing is, it's not necessary to do the Lyme testing if you've got the erythema migrans. Feeling is, if they've got the you know, multiple lesions, it's erythema migrans, treat them for 21 days. The Lyme testing can be done, but it's all it's going to do is say, yep, it's positive. It's not worth the money. Another thing is, you don't screen people within, that live in endemic areas that, have, that are completely asymptomatic. Third is patients with nonspecific symptoms only that do not live in endemic areas. We have a lot of patients that will come in and they'll say, oh, I'm aching and I'm sore, and we will see patients have ordered Lyme titers. If they have not been out in the woods, if they haven't had the deer tick on them, it's just not going to happen. By the way, a uh, little something that's sort of interesting, that tick bite. It needs to be biting on. That nymph has to be biting for 24 to 48 hours before the uh, um, Borrelia burgdorferi is transmitted. So if you see a tick walking along on you, you're not going to pick up Lyme disease from a deer tick just walking on you. <coughs> you really need to limit the t testing to patients who have a high index of suspicion. It's not a screening test. Tick bite, 24 to 48 hours. Serial conversion usually takes about a week after the deer tick has bitten you. And so it's, it's not indicated unless you have a patient with fevers, potential exposure like in an endemic area, history of rashes, or specific signings such as Bell's palsy, such as the carditis, such as the arthritis. Those are the patients that you really want to look at. Otherwise, leave the Lyme test out of there. It's an expensive test and it's not going to help you a lot. And that, you know, now we go on to the, finally, the, the, or next is the radiology things, and there were three areas that the um, ACR came up with. First one is don't perform MRI on the peripheral joints to monitor inflammatory arthritis. Second of all is repeat, repeating uh, routine DEXs more than every two years. And last is routinely uh, performing surveillance joint radiographs. Um, these are the basic options that I have in my office to look at a joint when a patient comes in to see me. We can do plain x-rays and CTs, we can do MRI, and we can do the newer, more popular test, which is musculoskeletal ultrasound. Um, plain radiographs, they're easy available. I have a unit in our office. We can look at it, I can get the result back. Within, by the time the patient's in, back in my exam room, I can look at the plain x-ray. It's great for looking for fractures, for joint space, for erosions. Its limitation is it doesn't help that much with soft tissue injuries. The erosive changes really show an advanced disease. That's something that's nice in an RA patient to see if there are new erosions. But if I'm losing it you know, to make the diagnosis, guess what? That patient's already had it by the time they get erosions. And it does show anatomy and architecture. This is one that everybody comes in and, oh, I've got hip pain. Well, let's do an x-ray. X-rays only show anatomy and architecture. They don't show pain. Never have, never will. Um, MRI and x-ray. This is about 15 years ago when we were doing all these new studies on those newfangled drugs for RA. We were trying to come up with new ways to pick it up. And we found that this is a study that was done back in 2004. And what they saw was that they could pick up erosions with MRI long before it shows up on plain x-rays. And I think that's sort of important in an RA patient because if you can pick up the, X, you know, the sign of an erosion, you can push a lot more to get more aggressive with the treatment. The only problem with the MRI is it's extremely expensive. And so that's one of the things. There's been a lot of kickback on that. And the, the biggest thing is here, I'm going to go quickly because, we're, you know, because we were a little bit late. Um, what they found was that erosions showed up in, you know, were able to, basically, they could find that uh, x-rays showed up about two to three years after it showed up on MRI. Now, the new option we've come up with is musculoskeletal ultrasound. We're doing this in my office now, and it's much, much better than plain x-rays. It gives two-dimensional ultrasonography. Um, we can center it where the, oh, where the primary complaint is. We, we don't, it's no radiation. It's useful because it can pick up erosions before it shows up on x-ray. It can actually pick up if there's inflammation, bursitis, and synovitis. We can actually pick up if there's a likelihood of carpal tunnel syndrome if we do a wrist. Um, ligament, tendon, muscle injuries can be picked up wonderfully. It is highly operator dependent. 
And so you need to make sure, if you're having someone doing musculoskeletal ultrasound, that they know what they're doing. And so that's an important thing. Um, the MRI, as I mentioned, it is good for picking up pathology of the tendons, ligaments, and muscles. No radiation exposure. And it can actually pick up erosions. But the thing is, it's a prolonged test. Very expensive equipment and very expensive test. And I'm, I'm claustrophobic. I hate being in an MRI. I really don't like it. Now, this is basically a nice quick review of the three forms of x-ray. And I think that right now, the, X, the um, insurance companies would much rather we do, if we're going to check out a patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, they'd much rather us monitor their mo uh, disease activity with ultrasound than, rather than MRI because of the cost and because of the convenience. And that's just the, basically what this one says. Now, radiographs and JIA, we've already gone over. Let's mention the DEXA situation. Now, by definition, osteoporosis is thinning of the bone with reduction in bone mass due to depletion of calcium and bone protein resulting in increased fragility. Risk factors for osteoporosis. These are the ones that, we are, that are things you think about, and these are all risk factors, and these will help you decide is a patient a good idea to do a, a DEXA. Obvi obviously, females are more likely to have osteoporosis. Early or surgical menopause. Inflammatory diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, these diseases increase bone loss. Corticosteroid use, obviously it causes early. Tobacco use is another one. Usually it's more in Caucasian and Asians. Smaller framed females, heavy uh, alcohol intake, and family history of hip fracture. These are all some of the more common risk factors that you should be looking for when you talk about a patient and deciding if they need a bone density test. The utility is you can assess them for future fracture risk, confirm the diagnosis of osteoporosis, monitoring the effects of treatment. That's a big one. And you can also, if over time, can see what's the rate of bone loss. Let's say you have a patient comes in and it's perfectly normal. Four year, three or four years later, you do another one and you've seen a pretty significant drop. That's somebody you may want to watch a little closer. Uh, and then it also... This is another interesting thing. It helps the patient to comply with treatment because they, I have patients who come in there and they, when they want that bone density test, they want to know, did my bones get any better? And so it's, it's a way to help them, you know, to give them some positive reinforcement when they actually see improvement in their bone density. Um, this is the indications for bone density testing. All women over the age of 65 should have had a bone density test. Men over the age of 70 should have one. We don't think of men a lot. I think of them. My father-in-law fell on Christmas Eve and broke his hip. Whether he fell and broke his hip or he broke his hip and fell is anybody's guess. But when they finally got him you know, after surgery for hip, you know, hip surgery, that's when they did the bone density test and discovered he was osteoporotic. Uh, patients with a history of a fragility fracture. Um, all right, patient, adults with disease that are associated with lone bone density. Um, those who are taking medications, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Anyone treated for lone bone density to monitor it, and anyone who is not receiving therapy in which evidence of bone loss would lead to treatment. Um, this is just the WHO criteria. We normally talk of that the, it's in terms of T-scores, which is basically comparing that person's bone density to that of a 30-year-old person, the same height, same race, same um, sex. Um, osteopenia is ne one to two, negative 1 to negative 2.5 standard deviations. Osteoporosis, that is diagnosis when it is more than negative 2.5. Severe osteoporosis is when it's more than 2.5 and you have a history of a fragility fracture. The interesting thing is, these are some of the things that go along with how we get a fracture. And you see there's the type of fall can result in the force of impact. You can see neuromuscular function and environmental hazards increases the risk of fall, bone mass, and strength of bone, all of these can list, lead to the risk, increased risk of fracture. Um, we know that it's interesting that not only does, is it just the bone density, but age also plays a role. You'll notice here that a, um, here is a, um, uh, you can see here is that as we get older, a 50-year-old with a, um, a T-score of negative 2.5, or negative four has the same risk of fracture as you know an eighty as as, as a um, as say a let's go down here try and find a really good there that's about it a patient who has a negative two point oh 
So as you get older, you are also at a bigger risk, even in, if your bone density doesn't show it. Um, how many of you are using the FRAX tool in your office? That is good to see. All of you should be using it. This is set up by the World Health Organization, and it was out of University of Shelf Sheffield in England. And what it does is it takes the combination of risk factors and your uh, bone density test. Looks at the T-score at the femoral neck, and it looks at various risk factors. At the bottom of it, it will give you a num information on a 10-year fracture risk. And what they look at is they will give you a number and say, this patient has a, a risk of a fracture over the next 10 years. And you tr the, the idea in this one is that there are patients out there who have osteopenia or low bone mass, but they don't reach that osteoporosis thing. But then you say, they got a lot of risk factors. Let's find out if they really are at a bigger risk for a fracture than waiting for that negative 2.5. And what they, by putting in the patient's sex, their uh, race, their height, their weight, whether their parent broke a hip, whether they have rheumatoid arthritis, what medicines they're taking, all that stuff in there is all taken into account. When the score is given, they will, you, the, the indication for treatment is if the patient has a greater than 20% chance over the next 10 years of a major fracture, they should be treated, and if they have a greater than 3% chance of a hip fracture over the next 10 years. This is a nice test because it lets the patient know this is what you are more likely to do. And they've shown that if you treat when these areas, that's more cost effective. And that's why it's an important test to do. You can go online. At the, you put in FRAX and it'll take you to the University of Sheffield in England. And you'll see the guy who came up with it. And, they, and you find your, the patient's race and everything else. It's a wonderful, easy test to do. It can be done in a matter of two or three minutes. Many DEXs actually come with it now, and so that's an exciting thing. Secondary causes of osteoporosis. Obviously, one of the things is how many patients have osteoporosis uh, from secondary causes. Obviously, endocrinology, endocrinologic problems are the very common. Neoplasms, multiple myeloma, mastocytosis, lymphoma, um, osteogenesis imperfecta, Gaucher's, homocystinuria, and then certain diseases do. There are certain medications, and these, some of these obviously you know, excessive thyroid replacement, glucocorticoids, um, dilantin does, gonadotropin agents. One that I think a lot of people don't realize is a risk factor for osteoporosis is down here, aromatase inhibitors. There are a lot of women that are being put on five years of aromasin, and this is going to help to promote osteoporosis. These are patients you need to keep a watch on because they can develop a bone loss pretty quickly. There's a whole host of other uh, musculoskeletal things, but that's a whole talk in of itself. And last but not least, proton pump inhibitors. If you have a patient who's taking Prilosec over the counter for days and weeks and months, that can help to uh, cause bone loss as well. So keep that in mind. Um, these are some of the risk factors for glucocorticoid osteoporosis. I'm going to jump over that. Now, the question is, the, the bone density testing, when should you think about doing it? And what, what you look at is you're trying to figure out when the expected change equals or exceeds the least significant. It takes time for that bone density to change, which is why it's usually not a good idea to do it more than once every two years. Um, the, and it needs to be, you have to look at the patient's clinical status. About the only time I look at doing it after one year was if you've started treatment or changed therapy. Longer intervals are usually once the therapeutic attack, uh, effect is established, and you may do it shorter if there's more bone loss expected. Um, the least significant change in terms of things that you can see here is anywhere from 3 to 5 percent, and so it's important to keep in mind seeing a little bit of change may not help that much. Um, Again, going over everything, you want to see, you know, when should you do them um, to monitor response, evaluate for non-response, and to follow patients who are at risk for bone loss to see if you need to make a treatment. And this is what the uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommends. And they even say that, you know, longer intervals may be needed to see um, if they have enough um, fracture risk protection. And again, that's just stuff I've gone over. All right. Um, I want to talk, last thing I think I'm going to be going over just briefly about rheumatoid arthritis. In the American, in the, one of the five things talked about how do we approach RA. Now, rheumatoid arthritis by definition is a patient with multiple inflamed joints. Things we use, we're using a combination of joint involvement by doing joint counts. 
the positive CCP and rheumatoid factor, acute phase reactants, and you know, duration of symptoms greater than six weeks. Um, most of the time, a patient comes in, and a lot of times I can make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis just on their history. They have pain in the MCP joints. They've been stiff for two or three hours in the mornings. They have pains in the wrists. They have uh, swollen joints, can't be doing as much. It comes up pretty quickly. Lab tests, the rheumatoid factor is one we all know about. 80% of people have a positive rheumatoid factor. Problem is the rheumatoid factor may be negative in early RA. There is another blood test that is very helpful if you're trying to decide if a patient has early RA, and that is the CCP, or cyclic citrullinated peptide antibody. This is one that can actually show up as much as three to five years before full-blown RA develops. And so this is one where if a patient comes in, has some joint pain, I do these tests, and lo and behold, the CCP is positive, that's one I want to see. And most rheumatologists in this country, if you tell the them they have got a patient with joint pain and a strongly positive CCP, they'll get that patient in within a week. Because that's the person you can really make a difference in stopping their disease before it causes any problems. The one problem about x-rays, you'll see down here, x-rays may not show erosions until much later in the disease. And again, this is where the musculoskeletal ultrasound can come in. These are the traditional DMARDs, and you can see methotrexate's at the top of it. This is the one we still start most patients on. Leflunamide and sulfasalazine. Sulfasalazine was a drug that was first designed for RA. It sort of fell out the wayside. If you're in London or Paris, they're going to use that a lot more as a first-line treatment. Hydroxychloroquine is a mild one. It's not that strong, doesn't work that well. I may try it in early, early RA before they show really any problems, but it's not that good. Gold salts we pretty much don't use anymore because we have so many other medicines. Um, these are some of the new TNF drugs. You've seen them advertised. We have actually five, and you know, if you count galimumab that comes in with uh, you know, so Symphony Aria, uh, we have you know, a lot of more options than we did 15 years ago. These are some of the newer drugs that you may hear about. Abatacept is a medicine that works through the CTLA-4, uh, which is a co-stimulator of T cells. Works very early in the course. This is one that works particularly well in patients who have really strongly positive CCP antibodies. Rituximab knocks out activated B cells. We discovered that because when patients with lymphomas got treated with it, their RA got better. Uh, Tocilizumab goes through IL-6. There's a new one coming out pretty soon. And a Kenra IL-1, we don't use it that much because it just isn't as good. And the newest one that's been out there, this is a small molecule, tofenicinib, and it's a Janus kinase inhibitor. There's another Janus kinase inhibitor that's going to be coming out in the next, probably the next six months. And so we do have some other medicines available. Now, why do we want to treat earlier? Because the earlier we can get this disease, the better. Our goal is not to use those biologics. They are expensive, $25,000 to $40,000 a year. That's why they, we try to use these other medicines first. This is an interesting study that was done. And it, what you see here, these are patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and it's talking about how early treatment was started. And what they saw is if you started sulfasalazine or chloroquine in the first two weeks of the disease, you actually saw that you were able to get the disease under control. Contrast to waiting just four months. That's not that long a time. And you can see, if you waited four months, how quickly the disease gets worse. This is why it's very important if you have someone who you think has RA and they're CCB positive, getting them in and getting them started on treatment is the way to go. Now, when we monitor it, there are certain things we need to do. Therapeutic dose now, we're gone a little higher because we're using um, uh, folic acid. That's required a higher dose of the methotrexate to work. Uh, parenteral may actually work better in higher doses. I have a lot of people who will switch from oral methotrexate to the injectable, and it works wonderfully. Um, child, women with childbearing age need to use birth control. That's something we harp on them big time. Monitoring, we'll watch for CBC, liver, and renal studies, and we'll always get a chest x-ray. Side effects, we watch for the more common ones are oral ulcers, GI intolerance, and rash. That's what the folic acid helps to cut down on. Liver enzymes and hematologic abnormalities are very rare. They are very unusual. On rare cases, we can see a methotrexate lung and a reversible lymph proliferative disorder. And that was one that's Epstein-Barr viral related. Basically, you stop the medicine, it goes away. It's really sort of a bizarre thing. So not everybody who has a lymphoma with RA on methotrexate needs treatment. Basically, the biggest thing is when we talk about 
the future of medicine. We've got to look at ways to help with, you know, from our side, show some interest in trying to cut back on what cost is. Tomorrow you're going to hear about macro and MIPS and all that kind of stuff. And hopefully what the Choosing Wisely program, this is something that's online at the ABIM. You can find these. Every single specialty has them. And so if you really want to get, you know, some fun and take a look at what some of the recommendations are in various specialties, this is a great way to see what they say works and does not work. So basically, um, it's too, you know, the, it does help to promote cost-effective practices. Although it was originally designed for the specialists in the area, the recommendations are very good and very pertain, you know, pertain really well to primary care doctors as well. And because MACRA is on us, choosing wisely can help us to make cost-effective choices and maybe help us to make those uh, points that we need when we do our MIPS.